Welcome to today's Cosmetrics webinar. Today we'll be covering No BS, Five Real Ways to Measure Influencer Marketing ROI. My name is Chewy Madsen. I work in marketing operations here at Cosmetrics. I'll be on Twitter during today's call and you can reach out to me at Chewy L. Madsen or you can use the hashtag KISSWebinar and we'll do our very best to follow up with you as soon as we can. But without further ado, I would love to introduce to you today's presenter, Rustin Banks, we're really excited to have you with us here, Rustin, but why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dewey, and so excited to be here and so honored that you would have me on this webinar series. So, hi everyone, my name is Rustin Banks. I'm the co-founder and chief product officer of a company called Tap Influence. We automate the process of influencer marketing through a marketplace and software. And I've been working on the problem of influencer marketing for seven years. I've been working on the scale problem, but really even more recently focused on this problem of measurement. How do we measure influencer marketing and prove to our bosses and to our brands that we work for that it really actually works? And so what I'm going to share today is in some ways the culmination of seven years of research and uh, that I've been doing in the influencer marketing space on how we actually tie this back to sales. Because at the end of the day, views and impressions are nice, but everyone really wants to know, how did I move the needle in sales of my product? So I'm on Twitter at Rustin B. Feel free to reach out to me there, and the company name is on Twitter as Tap Influence. Well, let's jump into it. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to go through a super quick introduction of influencer marketing, some of the latest statistics around influencer marketing and definition of influencer marketing. Then we're going to go through five real ways to measure ROI of influencer marketing. And we'll talk through each of these and then finally we'll pull it all together in a nice summary. So for those of you who aren't aware, influencer marketing is a pretty simple practice and it's been around for hundreds of years. And this is the idea of getting someone who has an influential presence to share your product or your brand with their following. And now this primarily takes place online with social media. And primarily in modern influencer marketing, I'm talking about influencer marketing that's done at scale and that you can measure. And I'm not talking about the days of you know, spraying out a, a PR pitch to a thousand people and, and hoping one of them picks up. I'm talking about real influencer marketing where you're either compensating an individual to share a brand or product or really giving them a, a real reason to, to share your brand or product with their audience. And I'm in a way almost frustrated with all the fluff that goes on around influencer marketing metrics. People talk about reach and they talk about impressions and those things don't really matter. What really matters is, is moving the needle for your brand and your, your agency. And so I'm on a, a crusade, if you will, to get rid of the fluff in influencer marketing metrics and let's talk real numbers and let's not be scared about it because we, we know that influencer marketing actually uh, works. And um, you know maybe I'll tell a little story of, of, uh, of, of how this, this came to work is that uh, one day I came home and I found some uh, coffee creamer in my uh, fridge and we're not big coffee drinkers here and I said well where did this come from and my wife said you know I was browsing the uh, these blogs and I found this great salted caramel fudge recipe and it called for this coffee creamer as one of the ingredients and turns out that that was one of our uh, customers had used uh, Tap Influence to sponsor that article. So I knew that it worked and I said, how do we measure this across these millions of other people who are seeing this content and buying the product because they see the content? All right, well, let's jump in. Uh, thanks for indulging me with that little uh, personal example there. So you're in the right place. You're on the right webinar. Out of all the webinars you could be watching, this is the right one to watch because influencer marketing is on fire. People know that it works. They can feel it and they just need to now start measuring it and scaling it. So growth in this space has been at least 5x in 2015, and it's on that same trajectory this year in 2016. A big reason of that is that the whole deal around ad block. Now that people can actually raise their hand and say, nope, I don't want to see uh, banner ads. I don't want to see pre-roll on YouTube. 
And you know what? They can even uh, block sponsored posts on Facebook. And you saw a big, um, there was a plunge in the Facebook stock and people are, are saying that that was attributed to Adblock Plus being able to block all that sponsored content. So people know that they need a more real way and something that feels more organic to get their brand and message out there. Something that adds value to the consumer. And influencer marketing is the perfect one-two punch of that. It adds value and it has a great distribution, mass distribution. And so that's why it's such a big priority for CMOs this year. So again, you are in the right place. And just to share one more thing of why this webinar is so important, I was having a conversation with a company that you may know, it's called Disney, and they said, look, we want to put the big budgets into influencer marketing, meaning we want to take that big billion dollar TV budget and put it into influencer. It's just we need the measurement. We need to know like we know our TV knows. And then I said, well, how do you know your TV works for you? And then we delved into the, the methodologies behind their TV measurement, and we actually have started using a lot of those in the influencer marketing space, which I'm gonna to talk to with you today. So again, this was a lot of the catalyst for this conversation. So let's dive in to these five ways. These five ways are not, uh, they're not, fully inclusive. Again, I run at Tap Influence a measurement as a service team. So our software gathers a lot of the analytics, gathers all the reach, the views, the engagements. It has the ties into the e-commerce platform. But then my team goes a step beyond and we look at what other signals can we pull in to actually tie this back to sales. So I'm going to share with you our five most popular methods that we use on the measurement as a service team. And there are others, and I'm happy to discuss what those are uh, with you at, at any time. But we're going to talk about using loyalty card data, credit card data, pin to purchase data, and um, that one's this fourth one's is um, is actually a typo. This is share voice, and then finally e-commerce. So let's jump in, and each of these have pros and cons for different brands and different target customers different brand sizes so this is not a one size one is better for every brand it really depends on what kind of brand you are how big how small what your target consumers like how much you spend on influencer marketing and so on but let me talk about first one of my favorite methods of measuring influencer marketing return on investment and then that's actually by tracking influencer marketing exposure back to sales through loyalty card data. And this is actually how a lot of online media is measured today, meaning the majority of your TV advertising and display advertising, this is the de facto standard for how it's measured, how sales are measured. Let me show you how it actually works. So it's a little technical, so bear with me, but this is the idea that when someone sees a piece of marketing or, or a piece of advertising, we can cookie that person and then using one of these third-party providers we can match that cookie back to an email address essentially that they use to sign up for their loyalty card at either a grocery store or a drugstore primarily or maybe it's even an online retailer like a Macy's and so using that cookie matching we can then match that person and look at how much they purchased of that particular product in the past 52 weeks. And then we can find a control group who looks just like that person who has the same purchase pattern and accept that they did not see the, the advertising and marketing content. And then we simply look, we take that person who's seen the advertising and then we compare it with a control group going forward and we simply look for an increase of the person who has seen the influencer content over the control group and that would be your return on investment essentially. That would be how much your advertising moved the needle. Now to do this you need a partnership with a person who can match the loyalty card data to the cookies and to the, to the exposures online. Uh, the two leading providers in this space right now are Nielsen Catalina Solutions and Oracle through their acquisition of Data Logics, and we are um, Tap Influence is partners with both of these companies, 
And it's a little technical, but let me just show you how it works. Let me walk you through an example. It will give you a, a good sense of, of how you can actually track true sales through, lo through loyalty card data. So we did this. We partnered with Nielsen Catalina Solutions. And as I mentioned, this has been done thousands of times in the TV and the display ad space, literally thousands of times, but never in the influencer marketing or content space. So we partnered with Nielsen Catalina Solutions to do this for the first ever time in the influencer marketing space. This was earlier this year that we did this. And we partnered with a food brand. They went into the software and they chose 258 top fitness and food influencers. Now, a key here is that they did pick those influencers based on performance. That's not, maximizing ROI is not necessarily the topic of this webinar, but I do want to share that if you do want to maximize ROI, you do need to pick influencers based on their performance and based on their audio, audience versus just picking an influencer based on who they are or even their content and their reach. And I'll talk more about that a little bit. Now the influencers were asked to do a pretty simple assignment. This is pretty standard where they were asked to create content that they know their readers would like around a theme of meatless Mondays. So it was in football season, so it could be a football party, it could be a football recipe, and their only requirement was that it had to be a post, a story that featured the product, whether it was in the ingredients list or whether it was in the photo, and again, uh, Fully FTC disclosed that this was sponsored content brought to you on behalf of the brand, so fully FTC compliant. And then the influencers shared this content out via social media. So there was no additional paid distribution on top of this. This was uh, just the initial, uh, the influencers were compensated to create the content and share the content out via their social networks, but the, the posts weren't boosted or we didn't buy traffic back to the influencer content. Okay. This whole process was automated, managed, and tracked by the TapFusion platform. This is our signature product, and of course, this is what we do. It handles payments, FTC disclosure, insertion, and monitoring, and so on. And then inside of our software, this is a place called retargeting and conversion tracking pixels. So what we did is we took the Nielsen Catalina tracking pixel, and we pasted it here. We did some bulletproofing around it so that it could live inside of a content environment. And then this pixel got automatically inserted into every single one of those 258 different blog posts. So now, when someone clicks over from social media and lands on this post, that tracking pixel would then fire, and then Nielsen Catalina Solutions would attempt to match that viewer to their loyalty card data. And once they could find their loyalty card data, they could say, okay, we've matched a person, this person has seen the influencer content, and now let's look at their purchase history for the past year, and then let's find a control person from our panel, of they have a 100,000 person panel in the United States, who looks exactly like that person who just read that recipe blog post, in every different way, psychographics, demographics, etc. Then let's look at their purchase history going forward. Now if we see, and again they do this over thousands of matched households, and so if the influencer marketing worked, we would hope to see a separation from these two lines, meaning that going forward, after seeing the content, people who view the influencer content buy more than a control group. The reason the control group is so important, and this is what really sold me on this methodology, is it gets rid of any other effects from either in-market advertising, or seasonality and truly separates only the components of influencer marketing into the results. Okay, I'm going to share a few of the results of this study so you can see that we're actually getting to ROI. Um, we did learn that exposed consumers did purchase more. I'll exact, get into exactly how much more in a minute. The other neat thing they can tell you is because they have access to the loyalty card data and you're probably already wondering in your mind, well, what if they, they don't have a loyalty card? What if this is for a store or a product that is not purchased in the store? We'll get to this at the end, but that is uh, one of the pros and cons of this measurement method, is it does work best for primarily CPG and food brands. But the neat thing they can do is, because you do have that loyalty card data, they can tell you which brands or products that they bought more of and which products that they brought, bought less of. So you can actually see how well you were at either getting your customers to buy more 
or even stealing from other competitive products. Uh, let's let's actually talk about then what sales lift. So this is sales lift is the same or is the the next door cousin of return on investment. So sales lift what they do is they normalize it to what are the incremental sales per 1,000 people who saw the influencer content. So this way you can compare it in an apples to apples way of a program other types of marketing spends. Whether you're spending on a thousand TV impressions or whether you're spending on a thousand display ad impressions. Well let's see how the influencer marketing in this example stacked up. So a thousand people who viewed the influencer content that I showed you they generated $285 of incremental sales over the control group. So every thousand people who read those recipes bought $285 more of the product over a control group. And the customer told us that blows everything else they've been doing out of the water. And we said, well, give us some more details on that. And they said, well, look, we're used to in the display ads category getting about $16 of incremental sales per 1,000 impressions. And you were giving us $285 per 1,000 views of the influencer content. So about 17 to 20 times higher in this case. Uh, but, however, influencer marketing views do cost more than a simple banner ad impression. So before you jump to the conclusion that, oh, it's 20 times better, we do need to take into account the spend that you spend on influencer marketing. Let me show you how to do that real fast. Uh, how to take the spend into account, but real fast, there are more sales per impression in influencer marketing because when that tracking pixel fires, you get true engagement. Someone's leaning forward and actually really consuming the influencer content. And then it's the whole promise of influencer marketing is that halo effect. When people see content created by an influencer that they trust, that halo from the influencer passes to the brand. They know the influencer is pseudo endorsing the brand even if they don't come out and give a full product endorsement. That doesn't happen in display ads. People know that the content and display ads and pre-roll that surrounds influencer content is in no way affiliated with or endorsed by the influencer. Not so when they're actually creating content. Okay, let's get into the ROI, but something else to point out is that you can actually then get even more ROI by reusing all this influencer content. So we have a lot of our brands who actually fuel their entire social media by reusing influencer content because they found that influencers could create content better and cheaper than an internal design team. So here's the real kicker though that you need to think about when measuring influencer marketing ROI. Depending what type of influencer marketing you're doing, you may have ROI that lives forever. In this case, it was a blog-based program. So our tracking pixel measured 540,000 impressions on November 30th. When we looked three months later, we had 1.3 million impressions with no additional paid post or paid distribution. This was all due to those posts keep coming up in Pinterest and keep coming up in Google and organic search and et cetera. And we actually plotted that. So here the posts went live. People, they kept coming up in December. In January, they did what we expected them to do to start to slowly decay. But then a huge spike in February as people were searching for football parties and football recipes and lo and behold these recipes kept getting cycled up in Pinterest they would love it they would then pin it and then all their friends would see it and then pin it and the cycle keeps continuing so this is actually kept continuing today um, getting about between 50,000 and 100,000 impressions per month so something really important to think about when you're measuring influencing and marketing ROI is you can't just report back to the your superiors or the brand uh, right when the content's done going live, you could be missing all the story. More than 100% of those impressions could come after that last uh, post goes live. So this is what it looks like. If you look at a CPM of influencer marketing, essentially because you keep getting more views of the content and you didn't have to pay any more, that cost per impression keeps on dropping rapidly. And in this case, the CPM had a half-life of three months. Every three months, the CPM was halved. And so if the CPM cost per thousand impressions goes down every three months in half, that means the ROI effectively doubles every three months. So this is the actual return on investment measured by Nielsen Catalina using loyalty card data over the control group 
on a dollar per dollar basis. So here in February they were sitting at three dollars of return for every dollar that they spent. But again, because they keep getting views and of that content without having to pay more for it, in April it was up to five dollars. And now here we are in July, and I think we're actually beating this projected curve a little bit. They're up at about eight dollars. And just in comparison, when we asked them what a good marketing program is, they said, ah, it's about two dollars. And so again, this is why you need to keep reporting on those results, because if we would have stopped in November, December, we would have only been at the two dollars. Now we're up at about eight dollars. And just want to point out real fast that this does not include shoppable views from social. That was blog posts only. And we all know that posts get viewed many more times on social media than they do on blog posts. So if we would have included uh, those views in social media, the results could have been dramatically higher. So we feel like this is actually a conservative estimate of influencer marketing ROI. Really fast, they did get this performance by using the trifecta of data. So just know when you're doing influencer marketing, modern influencer marketing is not about just picking influencers based on their reach and their rate. You have to take into account the performance data and the audience data. So in other words, inside of our software, we have a cost per engagement next to every influencer that measures what is the true cost per engagement when this influencer has been commissioned by a brand to do a piece of sponsored content. And that cost per engagement changes based on the assignment type that they have selected. It might be different for an Instagram assignment versus a blog post assignment. But this can really be helpful because without this, you might be tempted to choose this influencer who has a bigger reach and a lower rate, but something's wrong with this influencer sponsored content here at the bottom. Maybe they posted at midnight. Maybe, heaven forbid, they bought their followers. So we show this rate back to influencers and say, look, you either need to increase your engagement or lower your rate to stay competitive in the marketplace. The other thing you need to do is look at the audience of these influencers. So what you can do is go in and actually now using modern tools, you can profile each influencer's audience and actually see which percentage of their audience matches your target audience. And this way you can actually find real gems of influencers who may not charge very much because their reach isn't very big, but they reach the exact people that you want to reach. And so they're a much better option than versus selecting one of these mass influencers who might have a couple million followers. All right. So that is, again, that wraps up loyalty card data. In summary, again, you do need a partnership with one of these loyalty card matchback providers, either Nielsen Catalina Solutions or Data Logics. And again, works best for CPG and food brands and in the, call it, Fortune 5000. So let's get into something that might, some other options that might work for different types of brands. So next is credit card data. This one is specifically for retailers. And this works similarly to the previous program, but it works with any retailer and anyone using any kind of credit card. So how this works is, again, it's cookie-based. And we can talk later about uh, programs that aren't cookie-based. With Instagram, for example, you can't drop cookies, so you have to be uh, a little more tricky there. So if someone lands on this post about spring looks for Kohl's, what they can do is, again, use a cookie to match this person actually to their credit card data. And again, that's done completely anonymously in an, uh, in an opt-in basis, and again, requires a partner to do that. Uh, Cardlytics is the leader in the space who makes this happen. But essentially what you can do is similar to the program we talked about, then you can look at how much this person who viewed this influencer content spent at Kohl's in the past 12 months, and then look at how much they spent after they viewed the influencer content, and again, compare that to a control group, someone who didn't see the influencer content. So again, it is very similar to the loyalty card data, but this time you're looking at a retailer and looking at all their credit card transactions. So this works very well with Kohl's, with Sephora, with Macy's. Anytime you are at that retailer level, uh, this is a fantastic way to measure the influencer marketing ROI and actually in-store sales. Okay. So again, those ones require uh, partnering with uh, third-party either credit card or loyalty card providers. 
let's look at a very successful way we've used to measure uh, without using a third party provider. And the nice thing is what we call this is pin to purchase. And how this works is that if you are a certain vertical, this works best for food and fashion brands. When someone pins a piece of content, whether that's an image or whether that's a post, that's a signal that they are likely to buy that particular product. And if we can measure which percentage of people who pin something actually go on to buy something, we can actually get an ROI using the Pinterest signal of someone pinning a piece of content. So let me give you an example to, to show you how that would work. So essentially you might be working with Ragu or you might be Ragu and you might have commissioned uh, sponsored recipes that include Ragu products. And of course these sponsored recipes, when someone sees this they say I want to make this so I'm going to pin this. That's why people pin things because they want to make it. So they might pin this recipe, this show, then shows up in Pinterest inside of their recipe board and next time they go to, to plan their shopping trip, they're going to pull their recipes and ingredients from this Pinterest list. So then what you do is then you can take that same audience and say, okay, which percentage of recipes that you pin do you end up making? And this is just a simple survey to people who either view that influencer content or people like that who view the influencer content. And then you need one more key recipe key number to get the ROI. You need to ask them when a pinned recipe calls out a name brand ingredient, which percentage of time do you choose the name brand ingredient? So you can see those two key percentages right there. Meaning, okay, if you pinned it, are you going to make it? Okay, if you make it, are you going to use the branded ingredient? And if you know both of those things, you can then get a good idea or at least model of when someone pins something how many resulted in purchases. Now you might be even a little more specific in this second question, especially if you're looking at an, auto, an anonymous audience. You can say if a pinned recipe called for a ragu product, which percentage of time would you choose ragu versus a generic? Because this number can change based on the brand. So sometimes we ask this second question and then only after they've answered the second question we show the more specific question where we say, okay, if you were faced with the Ragu brand versus a generic. So then what we can do is we can look at how many pins of the recipes that we had. And then we can look at how many from this, all right, how many people ended up purchasing it. And then working with the brand, we can know what the lifetime value of these purchasers are and come up with an ROI equation here. So in this case, it was about $4 for every dollar that they spent on influencer they generated in lifetime value from these spaghetti sauce purchases. Let me show you uh, another example with Kraft. So here's Kraft. It was a salad dressing. They commissioned in this case 40 influencers creating uh, this content. They had 907,000 people engaging on this content. But of that engagement, 710,000 of them were pins. So again, using this Pinterest model of surveying those people who, some of those 710,000 people who pin this content, asking them if they were going to make these particular recipes, we were able to derive a short-term sales of 426,000. Now Kraft spent $12,000 on these influencers, so a massive ROI for the Kraft brand. So just as a side note, this works fantastic for food brands. And influencer marketing for food brands is a no-brainer. Influencer marketing works well for all verticals, but food is the top performing category for influencer marketing in terms of return on investment. And I should mention before I move on, this also works well with fashion brands. Again, any brand where a pin is a signal that to purchase, again, food and fashion being the top, you can then survey those people and talk to them and see how likely they are to go ahead and purchase that particular product. Awesome. Beauty is another we see that, that does well in the space. Okay, so that's pin to purchase. Let's get into one of my favorite. It's a little more technical, but this is using influencer marketing to measure the shift in share of voice. So a little bit of a background in this, and again, this works best for 
uh, medium to large size brands who are established in a space, uh, someone like Origins in the makeup and beauty space. So for example, what we have found and we see more of a trend happening is that share of voice on social media is starting to directly correspond to market share. Meaning if I can measure all the times Origins is mentioned positively on social media and not just measure the number of times it's mentioned but num measure how many people are seeing those mentions and then compare that with my competitors, a 5% shift in that share of voice can result in a 5% market share increase. And again, we're, we're seeing this come more and more true in lots of different indus industries, but especially in the beauty industry. So what we can do here then is, as you can imagine, look at the share of voice before an influencer marketing campaign and you can do that with a number of social listening tools, but the key is the tool cannot be number of mentions based. It has to take into account how many people saw those mentions. So in other words, if uh, someone with 10 followers mentions origins authentically, that's very different than someone with a million followers mention, mentioning origins in a positive, uh, positive way. But if you take that into account, you can essentially say, what is the share of voice or share of view in social media amongst your competitors? And again, you can do this with a number of social listening tools. And then you can see how influencer marketing campaigns affect that. You can essentially isolate that for a period of time, run a big influencer marketing campaign, say in October, uh, for example, and look at the effect of the share of voice to, and then that will relate to market share. Okay, so then again, this is one that we've seen work very well. Let's talk last about e-commerce. So e-commerce is tricky in the influencer marketing space, to be honest, because influencer marketing usually does not get a good rap in the e-commerce space, and this is because of the way e-commerce is tracked. And typically, the way that's done is essentially with an attribution model. So essentially what the most popular attribution mod model is nowadays is last click. Meaning what's the last click that brought me to a product? So let me give you an example of why influencer marketing typically doesn't hold up well here. So if I'm on Instagram and I see a pair of shoes that I love, I think wow, I love those shoes. I can't even click on Instagram to get at those shoes. So I immediately go to Google I search up that brand of shoes and of course then I purchase the shoes and nowhere is that influencer marketing going to register as a, as a last click model. So I'll talk about some ways around this but first you need to know which attribution model uh, to look at for influencer marketing. Does the last click get all the credit? Does the first click get all the credit? And so on. Well the important thing to do is start using pixel based attribution. Meaning lots of people think of the click as the only action that brought about the sale. But we find with influencer marketing that's not the case. Again, thinking of my shoes example, when I saw those shoes, I didn't click on anything, but I saw that shoe and that made me take action. So to, as much as we can measure views instead of clicks, you're going to get a much truer picture of what the return on investment is and how influencer marketing ended up driving e-commerce sales. So there's a couple ways to do that, but the most important is just see if you can use pixel-based tracking instead of click-based tracking and start embedding tracking pixels inside of all your influencer content instead of relying on clicks. So once you have that, then you can start looking at your attribution models based on exposures. Is it my last exposure, my first exposure, and so on? what we find is a blended exposure works the best. So for example, and we're starting to see this change a little bit, but the first exposure might be worth 50% of the sale. The last exposure might be worth 30% of the, the sale. This changes depending on what type of brand you are. Uh, for example, some of them we see the last exposure up to 50-60%, the first exposure around to 30%. But the key is both are important inside of the sales process. And again, if you're using exposure based, you can really give influencer marketing its share shake instead of just a click, which may not be possible in influencer marketing. 
if you're doing a lot of Instagram influencer marketing where people can't click, what you want to do is actually demote search because Instagram leads to search. So if you can essentially say what last happened before that person searched for my product, then you can actually separate what's happening from Instagram. So if you do a bunch of influencer marketing and you see a spike, spike in your search-based e-commerce, that was likely due to your Instagram influencer marketing. All right, let's talk, we've talked a lot about B2C, but though a lot of those lessons, especially the last one, are applicable in the B2B space. But let me do one bonus tip for SMB and B2B. And this is super simple. It's something we've seen a lot of people do very effectively. But this is simply in your checkout page, lots of people have this, how do you hear about us? And these menu options don't really do anything to help you separate out if influencer marketing works. So for often they just say social media. Well, how do I know if a friend, if I saw that from a friend in social media or if I was just browsing social media? So what we recommend small businesses do is give them two options. Say I saw it from a social media friend or I saw it from on social media someone I follow or browsing social media. What this will really help do, we've seen a lot of brands actually say, oh, before I used to just see spikes in my general social media and I assumed that was from my social media content when really that was from influencer marketing. So simply just by adding this choice of either someone I follow or from browsing social media will let you start to separate how much sales are coming from influencer marketing. So this is what we do at Tap Influence, for example. So we look at, for example, we work with Jay Bear. We do influencer marketing with Jay Bear. He'll share our content. We'll commission him to do uh, reports together. And we have seen people when we talk to them, when we survey them, how did you find out about Tap Influence? And they will say, look, when I saw this content, I wasn't in the market for an influencer marketing platform. But when I finally was, that's when I knew to go check out Tap Influence. And so they wouldn't have shown up in any type of click attribution model. They would have shown up in a search-based model. So that's why search is key. Search ends up getting, especially branded search, people searching for your brand, a lot of things get lumped into that category. For example, PR. But definitely look and see if you can correspond influencer marketing with brand-based searches. So for example, we work with Again, our own influencer marketing, and we saw this spike here in organic search when we did a big influencer marketing campaign for, again, we're a B2B business because that led to people searching for our brand on Google and landing on our landing pages. Okay, so in summary, we've been through five definitive ways to measure influencer marketing with a few tips, and again, they've got their pros and cons. Loyalty card data, fantastic for CPG and food brands. Credit card data, fantastic for any retail brands out there. Pin to purchase works for fashion and food brands especially. Um, this is the share of voice, works really well for beauty brands or other established brands that have competitors and know that their market share moves with their social media, share of voice. And then finally, almost every brand, e-commerce, really moving to that visual, that pixel-based, attribution versus that click-based attribution which can be so misleading especially in the influencer marketing space. Awesome! So this has been so much fun and again is the culmination of, of so much research and this is just the tip of the iceberg, the five most popular ways we find that brands are asking for to measure influencer marketing uh, but there's so much more so please feel free to reach out, you can see my Twitter, my email, uh, with any questions or if you would like to discuss influencer marketing measurement in more detail. It's, it's absolutely my passion. But this has been a, a pleasure and now let's, let's answer a few questions. Awesome, Rustin. Thank you very, very much. That was a ton of good information in there. As Rustin mentioned, if your question didn't get answered or if you would like to reach out to either of us, do feel free to do so on the information on the screen. So Rustin, just very first off, I have had a couple of people ask how do you get a tracking pixel and how do you implement a tracking pixel? Awesome, this is a, a, a fantastic question. So tracking pixels can most often be provided from your analytics per analytics provider and um, 
We can talk about uh, KISS metrics and their, and their capabilities there. Um, tracking pixels can also be provided by your uh, measurement partners. So for example, whether it's a, uh, whoever is responsible for measuring your influencer marketing. So Tap Influence has integrated tracking pixels inside of all their influencer content. When you're working with Nielsen Catalina Solutions or Data Logics, uh, the tracking pixels will be there. So again, most uh, measurement suites or whoever or whatever is responsible for measuring your influencer marketing uh, should have a tracking pixel that, that can be provided to you. Awesome. Let's see here. Um, Adam asks here, broadly, how do you approach influencer measurement when pixels aren't available, such as with podcast, YouTube channels, uh, Twitch streamers? I'm not sure what that last one is. Yeah, I mean, the, the best way there we've seen, of course, in, in podcasts is the classic uh, vanity URL. That works really well for a lot of brands I know. Um, you know, of course, going, we all hear the, uh, you know, go to audible.com forward slash this, for, for example, and of course, they're, they're tracking that. That works really well in the space, so if you are working with an influencer in the podcast space, simply providing them a simple vanity URL for their either on air or their uh, or their interruptive commercials uh, does does work really well. So if you can't do a, a tracking pixel, we do see a lot of vanity URLs still work well. But again, uh, you still got to break out that organic search because to be honest, Google is getting way too much credit. It's just people are using the Google search bar uh, like they are an address bar, and so they may hear about you on the podcast and they just don't remember that vanity URL and just a week later or it might even be months later they're going to type you uh, into Google. So the other thing you do is, is again look for those uh, Google spikes see if you can correlate them to when you spent on podcasts and other areas that don't have pixel tracking uh, because again Google is getting way too much credit for, uh, for its, its marketing share right now. Absolutely. Um, this has come up a couple of times, but Michelle asks and says, thank you for a great talk. Can you go into a little more detail about how to execute a share of voice tracking program? Yeah, so this is cutting edge. Uh, I will be honest to say the share of voice measurement has is, is pretty new, and it's still uh, a lot of the social media providers, social media monitoring providers are still pretty new in this space. Um, most brands, even small and medium businesses, are likely working with a social media measurement provider, um, uh, social listening, for, for example. Um, even small businesses can work with a company like Nuvi, N-U-V-I, and even for as low as a, a couple hundred dollars a month can have a social listening solution. The short answer is, is reach out to your social listening provider to talk about measuring share of voice. Uh, they have, uh, a lot of them have a lot of tips and tricks Brandwatch is probably the leader in this space. They've written a lot about measuring share of voice. Um, the longer answer is probably too long for this, uh, this question, but it does, again, involve measuring every mention of, of your brand, determining whether it's positive or negative, and then estimating to the best of your ability how many people saw that mention. Again, you have to weight a mention from someone who had 10 followers lower than someone who, who has a million followers. And you weight those and then do the same with your competitors and you come up with that share of voice um, measurement. But that's probably a, a longer conversation and uh, maybe I can talk about Tui about doing a, a full webinar on that with a partner like a, a social listening provider later. Absolutely. Do you have any resources for people who'd like to look into that more? Um, I do. Uh, Again, I think the best one comes from Brandwatch right now. If you search for Brandwatch share of voice, it may come up. Um, or I can work with uh, Tui to find a way to, to send that along afterwards. Absolutely. Uh, next question here is from Bruce, and Bruce asks, do you have any thoughts on Instagram included links in posts? Uh, at least through later.com, they say that's possible. Well, you can put a link in a post, you just can't click it. In, in Instagram, and again, this is with organic content. If you're talking uh, sponsored content where you're actually buying an advertisement on Instagram, you can include a, a link in the post. Um, but you can have instant influencers include a link, it just won't be clickable, 
Now what we see a lot of people do is there is one link allowed in Instagram and it's in the influencer's profile. So you've probably seen lots of times the brand will ask the influencer to put the link to the product in their bio for 24 hours as part of the contract. So let's say you're working with an influencer on Instagram. It's for uh, again e-commerce and it's for a um, new uh, bike and you're working with a mountain bike influencer. They'll say, hey everyone, check out my new giant uh, bike that I tried out. Uh, check my profile for the next 24 hours for a link to the bike and then people can click the profile and they can click on the link and go uh, go from there. So yeah, there's two. that's probably the most popular way and if you're doing that then you can put the tracking code on that link and actually look at how many people are clicking back but still I would probably uh, say that only 50 percent of people who end up buying are actually clicking that link the other 50 percent are just going to Google giant mountain bikes and uh, purchase the product there. Absolutely. Uh, this next question might be a little bit outside the scope but let's try it anyway. Ariana asks how can we measure sponsored content like videos that are usually moved from its original uh, URL? Some medias like BuzzFeed and Mashable just use your content but you lose track of it. How can we measure everything? Yeah, so I think what they're saying is, okay, if you create an influencer piece of content and then that content gets repurposed over the web, even if you had a tracking pixel inside of that video, for example, how do you uh, get credit when that video has, you know, uh, traveled around the web? Um, the simple, the simple answer is that, again, depending on who you're working with, if you can find the the right video provider, uh, you can actually have cookies uh, dropped and tracking dropped whenever that is repurposed. So, YouTube doesn't do this very well, uh, but for example, if it's a proprietary player like Bright Talk and, or uh, not Bright Talk, but um, Wistia, uh, you can put your tracking pixel in there and then if someone clicks the embed button on that and embeds it somewhere else, that same tracking pixel is going to fire wherever it's used. Um, but if you're using YouTube, a couple different ways, of course, YouTube Analytics will, will help some. It will give you an idea if you can ask the influencer for access uh, to their Google, to their YouTube Analytics or at least give you screenshots of it after a program. It'll tell you where the video was played, uh, what happened to the video, but it is going to be hard to drop that tracking pixel on a YouTube video when it is embedded in other places. Absolutely, that is, that is a hard question. Um, Rustin, let's take a couple more questions and then we will be rounding off and we'll be segueing into the demo of Kissmetrics. So the next question here is from Michael, and Michael asks, if I got it right, while wanting a, uh, running a brand campaign on social media, it would be clever to focus also on search ad because of brand searching. Is that correct? Yeah, and these are fantastic questions, by the way. This is a very sophisticated and smart audience. But that's exactly right. If you're doing an influencer uh, program, again, we've seen that at least half the results from the influencer program show up in the search because again people aren't either looking for the product at that moment or there's no way to click in the product that they're viewing and so they they go and they end up searching whether that's 30 days later, 60 days later, even immediately afterwards. So yeah, looking, doing a spike of influencer marketing or social media marketing and then looking for a corresponding spike in search activity, branded search activity especially, is a great way to measure if your influencer marketing is working. Awesome. Last question here is from Bruce and uh, Bruce asks, speaking of Twitch streamers, uh, this is a huge upcoming uh, influencer marketing niche. Any thoughts on this and how to use it? Yeah, Twitch is, is, is going to be amazing. For those who don't know, Twitch is a video game streaming service and so, or a streaming portal. And so if you are in the video game space, everybody's, uh, everybody knows about Twitch. Uh, we deal some with, with Twitch and have some conversations with them about how we're going to get those tracking pixels in there and, and embed them. But I think that's the next step is when they will open up their platform such that when people you know, are streaming their, uh, their videos to enable uh, the tracking of third-party pixels and then once that happens, then you can measure it the same way. 
Uh, you could, for example, do a retail study where you can match those people to their video game sales at, at Best Buy, although most people don't buy at a Best Buy anymore. Um, but you could look at their credit card data, for example, of Steam to see if they're purchasing the product, uh, the video game on, on Steam. Or you could do just regular e-commerce. You could pixel that person and then match those pixels back to when someone uh, purchases at an e-commerce website like Amazon. Yeah, an exciting area to, uh, to watch and developing in the video game space. Fantastic questions, everyone. This has been great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely, and thank you very much for your time, Rustin. Everyone, if you're interested in how Kismetrics can help you optimize your marketing and what our product looks like, feel free to stick around. If not, I really appreciate you guys taking the time and coming out here for today's webinar. Give me a second here as I switch screens, and we'll be right back. Let's see here. Can everybody confirm that you can see my screen now and you can still hear me? Awesome. I would love to show you a little bit about what we do here at Kismetrics, so let's dive right into it. So Kismetrics is a person-based analytics solution. So the way we like to see the world is that we sit on your digital real estate, your homepage, your app, or your online shop. In between all of the ways that you send traffic to that, we collect all of that and track it. So we are person-based, and what that means is that every single piece of data that we receive and that we store for you is tied to a single individual. So this is a fake profile I've marked up from uh, for a colleague of mine here. And you'll be able to see various things about this person. So the way we view the world is we track by a person, and then we track by events and properties. So the way that works is events are essentially actions that people take. So you can see here, Andy has done different things like visiting site, viewing pages, viewing specific pages, and so on, a lot more, more detail. And then we have different properties, which are essentially attributes about these people. So for instance, we can see here that Andy's first refer, the first time he ever came to us, was from app.kismetrics.com. We've made $2,000 in revenue from him, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the really, really neat things is that we never delete data. We store your data forever, so you can always get that full customer or prospect view all the way back in time. So we have a bunch of different reports, but one of our mo more popular reports is our funnel report, and it looks something like this. What you really want to look for here is you can see where you have drop-offs or what is not working in your funnel or what is working. So for instance, we have a very simple four-step funnel here, and you can see there's a major drop-off at the first step. And this is not that unusual that you have a lot more people that are visiting your site than people are actually submitting forms. But then there's a big uh, drop-off between the people who are actually submitting that form and the people that end up signing up. Only 6.2% end up signing up, and that's not good. So we know there's something to work on there. Then we can further break that down by our properties, which in this case is the channel, and we can see where people are coming from and how many people from each of these channels are actually going on throughout the steps. Another really cool report that we like to show is our cohort report, which allows you to cohort people over time by the action they do. So for instance, in the example here, we can see how many of the people that visited site, how many times did they have to come back, or how many days, before they actually ended up signing up for this particular product. And some of the interesting things we could see right here is, well, the people that come for organic are pretty consistent uh, over each day and how many actually end up signing up, whereas people that come from social aren't that likely to sign up within the first few days, but eventually almost all of them do sign up. And then you can either apply the strategy that you're using for your social channel to the rest of your channels to try and have more of the people sign up or the other way around to try and increase your velocity for your social channel. This is one of my favorite reports, it's our A-B testing report. So if you do um, split testing or A-B testing, this is something that's really, really interesting. Um, first off, what it does is it just does a simple A-B test calculation on statistical significance and improvement to allow you to see when you have an actual winner, how sure you are that the winner is a true winner, and what the impact of that test is. Now what's really neat is with the rest of your data, you can actually compare your conversion event that you're testing for, for instance, trying to increase number of people clicking a particular button variation, 
and then you can check if those people are truly more valuable down your funnel. What you don't want to happen is you have a winner where you have more people who click the green button than the yellow button, but the people who click the green button are not that likely to convert down the funnel and become paying customers. So our report really easily lets you check that against other step in the funnel and see if you actually have a winner all the way down. Another product that we offer is for you to take advantage of the insights that you gain from these data and actually go and engage your audience is a product called Engage. So for instance, right here, we have a drop-off in a funnel report between viewing the homepage and people actually registering for your service. Now, now that we know that we have a problem in our funnel here, we can actually go and take action. So the way the product works is you choose a specific action that you want to take. For instance, people who have been idle on the page for a duration of time or scrolled or something like that. And then you engage them either with a bumper or a light box or any other thing like that. So one way this could look, it could be something like a Pinterest page or, or community page, where if people don't sign up for your newsletter, you prompt them with this box that comes up and then ask them to join your community. In terms of implementation, our tool is like a lot of other data tools out there. You drop a pixel on your website and then you have a few different implementation options. One is to have your developer work on it, which is a fairly resource heavy way. The other way is once the pixel is on there, you can use a tool that we've developed called Click to Track, which is exactly that. It allows you to just click on any element on your homepage or in your product and then track that. So for instance, here I want to track this request a demo button. I simply click on it and then I name the event that I want to see inside of my analytic solution and that will track it for you. So that makes implementation really, really seamless. In terms of pricing, we are a paid solution. Uh, plans start at around $220 a month. The way it works is you choose a plan which determines how many reports or which type of reports and which type of integrations you get available. And then the second part of the plan is how much data you're going to be using. And that's essentially a reflection of how many different things you want to track on your site and how many visitors you have to your site. That's all I wanted to share for today. There's much more and we'd be very, very happy to show you more in detail how this applies to your business in particular. Do feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to help you out. Have a great day, everyone.